Galleons of clouds are becalmed, waiting for a wind. The lizard spins on its tripod, panning, to find the boulders below where slaves built the breakwater. The battle of the saints moves through the surf of trees. School texts rustle to the oval portrait of a cloud-wigged Rodney, but the builders' names are not there. Not Hector's ancestors, Philoctet's, no Achilles. The blue sky is a French tunic, its quarter gear the sunburst of a medal. The engraved ovals of both admirals fit when a school book closes in one locket. Screaming only in vowels, the children burst out of history. Some classes race past the breakwater, the anonymous cairn carried by a line of black ants, some up the street to crouch under the window ledge by Mark Kilman to shout at his elbow and frighten Philoctet, then yell, hey, seven seas in the American accent. One stalks near the growling dog on a bet. Their books are closed like the folded wings of a moth. The lizard leaps into the grass. You bend your head to hear Ioannolo from the cannon's mouth. I don't know too much detail about my ancestry because, I mean, uh, the African part is, is wiped out because, you know, any descendants of slaves cannot make any contact, really, with where they're from. Uh, and that's a ca Caribbean situation in many cases. Uh, it doesn't bother me because it's an idea. The idea of genealogy as history is not interesting to me. The islands of the Caribbean is extremely important because of the value of sugar, um, which, you know, we cannot estimate how valuable sugar was as a commodity. Uh, so that was crucial in the economy and other aspects of the economy of that time, um, but particularly sugar. Uh, so the, the, the fighting for the, you know, the ownership of the islands for the sugar industry of the plantations and so on between the Dutch, the French, the English, the Spanish was strong. Also it was strategically important. Um, so whoever were the empires that had bits of the island here obviously left their languages and some of the languages got mixed up with African. So you have a whole series of dialects. So the Caribbean as an archipelago in terms of the languages extremely rich because you have all these languages here as a base then you have African variations of the language which become what people call a dialect but which are turning into their own languages so that the whole territory plus apart from the fact that each island is different in terms of its melody in terms of the vocabulary and the melody of the language that it comes creates you know, like this island speaks English with a French accent and then there's French Creole, and then there's English itself. So in nearly every island, especially in St. Lucia or in Trinidad, there could be in Trinidad, for instance, six languages in a small place, you know, like with Hindu, um, <coughs> Chinese, you know, um, English, French, Spanish, you know, one island, great, linguistically very exciting. The access is to all the languages of the world from one place, I mean, melodically, to be perfectly legitimate for somebody in an African writer in Port of Spain to be interested in Chinese poetry, you know, um, because there are Chinese there or in Indian epic or whatever. So very rich and very complex. You can't write a poem every day, you know. Um, but since I work in plays and I work in theatre in verse, I am working in poetry in the theatre and you can always work on plays, you know. I came here with a director and I thought we could do a production of the Odyssey here because the bay is like a natural amphitheater. And then the sun, it's a very high mount, high hills, so it's always in the shade. So if you began at four o'clock in the afternoon, it would be in the shadow. And then you could have Ulysses' boat coming around the bay and then the monsters, the sea monsters and stuff and the crew coming out of the water. And then on this beach, you'd have the performance would be on this beach. And then behind it, you would put seats and bleachers, right? So you'd perform it in the open, you know, um, with the sea fights and everything. But it, as you will see, it's just a natural amphitheater. And the sound is very good. The acoustic is very good. Because there's a cock crowing and you can hear it easily, you know? Right. Terrific.
terrific, terrific theatre. Uh, Wonderful natural theatre. Yeah. Do you have, which play would you... This is, this is a play I've written called The Odyssey, an adaptation of The Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey. Yes, Odyssey, yeah. It's being done, it's been done at Stratford and it's going to be done in London again. And I brought the director, the director was here talking about it. And we came down here and got very excited about the idea of doing it, you know. So we mentioned it to Royal Shakespeare Company and they thought it was a good idea. And I'd like to have it happen because they could mix the actors, you know, and have it performed. Maybe for television it would be great, you know. Oh, yes. Or live, live it would be better. Por primera vez en la historia de la literatura contemporánea, el premio Nobel le fue otorgado al escritor del Caribe en lengua inglesa, Derek Walcott. Derek Walcott, premio Nobel 1992, nos pidió que esta entrevista se realizara en el lugar donde él nació. Estamos en la isla Pigeon Island, en Santa Lucía. Mr. Walcott, what does it mean to write in English from the Caribbean? I grew up speaking English. I grew up in English. Um, we have sort of two languages here. We have French Creole and English. I use both languages. I don't write my poems in French Creole, but in the theater, in the plays, I use a lot of French Creole expressions. So I grew up speaking English and learning English literature and English poetry. So I consider it to be, you know, a natural language for me, you know. You said that uh, when you were a child, you had to choice between reading comic books or mm. reading classics. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, this is, <clears throat> this was a poor island. It's getting better in terms of, you know, industry and its development and so on. So we didn't have, I think um, one of the things in cities or in countries that, are, that have more money and more access to things, along with whatever you get, you also get a fantastic amount of mediocre, you know, trashy stuff that's part of, of an urban life. In a small island where the libraries, if they're any good, have a very limited budget in terms of what they choose to have, then they would choose the best literature in the world first and, you know, so the middle kind of nonsense that sometimes gets published, to which a lot of people, you know, subscribe, was not easily accessible. So you only had almost two choices of either you would read something for entertainment, like comic books, there were other novels and so on, but not that many, and there weren't too many bookstores. So you had access directly to the classics or, you know, well, not as dramatic as just comic books, but mainly the contrast is what I'm saying, like that. What were your first readings? Well, there was a small, very good library at home. Um, my mother was a school teacher who used to recite a lot of poetry. Um, my father used to write verse and paint, and my mother used to act. So, you know, she was always reciting things in the house. Um, and then the very small library we had had some very good novelists like Dickens and Scott and an Italian writer called Sabatini, who I liked a lot and some poetry. But of course, the education at school was excellent, I think, in the, in the college here, because we had to do French, we had to do Latin, and of course, English literature, Shakespeare, and so on. So I think the level of the education, um, secondary school education at St. Mary's College was high, was strong. A poet is born a poet? Yes, I think that 
We are all born instinctively. There's an instinct in a child to rhyme, you know, to make a song, a rhyming song. Uh, and that instinct is a natural instinct in any child. Um, maybe that instinct to make a song uh, is part of the inner sense that is inside of poetry. Uh, and that's something that William Blake wrote about, that the inner sense that is there in the poet remains, even if there is experience as well. So at some point along the line, um, either children, I'm not saying that every child will grow up to be a poet, I'm just saying at some point along the line in schooling or something, people get <coughs> alienated from poetry uh, as something that has nothing to do with life. Of course, there is talent and there is prodigy, you know, uh, and then at some point along the line, um, in my particular case, I knew very, very early that what I wanted to do all my life was to write poetry. So I was lucky in that decision. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I think in every child anyway, instinctually, there's an instinct to be a poet. Innocence brings poetry. Well, the innocence is a sort of celebration, a joy in language. Um, and a, a wish to make things rhyme, I think. I think the sound of rhyme for a child it becomes a, a, a joy. You know, somebody says light and fight and a child makes it up. They have some sort of success with language. You know, the two things, some success in meaning, some, some delight in the music of two words sounding alike. Well, that's all poetry really does, no matter how large it is eventually. It's the music of words that happens, and all children have that. It's for you a joy to write poetry. Yes, when you're writing it, there's an agony and a joy at the same time. Um, but it's a combination of both, right? You like the agony of writing poetry, so there's a joy in the agony of writing it, yes. It's kind of an ambiguity, but I guess that's true. Mr. Walcott, the tension between of the Africa that you love and the English language that you also love very much, uh, it's a, a struggle. Um, I think that the struggle, uh, maybe in political terms, a lot of things have happened in terms of the realization of what Africa is. Of course, the history of Caribbean culture, Caribbean history itself, is mainly African because of the Middle Passage and slavery and stuff like that. At the point <coughs> in which I, was, I wrote some lines that are very often quoted about a division between Africa and, and English, or say the reality of black Africa and the English language, which, you know, might be considered in a way to be white, uh, or in the imperial language. But the conflict that is there is political and cultural. Mao rebellion in, in Africa, in Kenya, and so that the conflict of trying to place oneself in which the language causes a division of choice, political choice in a sense, you know, is what is dramatized. <coughs> there is, I think, but <coughs> beyond that, there is a reality that people who are brought over here from Africa or from India or from China or from the Middle East have to settle in a new place which they have to put down, in which they have to put down roots. And the conflict continues in terms of the ancestral home, and, you know, and the home that you are now placed in that has to become a home. And all these conflicts that happen in terms of the past and tradition and so on is part of the New World experience. It's very focused if it is in, in, in terms of slavery and so on. So you have a situation in which the descendants of slaves are speaking the language of the master. At the same time, <clears throat> what language does is language puts down roots for people. It fortifies, you know, a people. It gives them a, a rootedness in their own literature. So even if the conflict is there, the fact that it is dramatized makes literature out of the conflict. And if that literature is moving and true, then it has, that has been dramatized. So that if there is a poem about the conflict, the result is a poem about the conflict. So that you do have, in the resolution of the conflict, you may have a work of art, and that's where the resolution comes. But in terms of, say, the heritages that exist in the Caribbean. I think the difficult thing is not to completely to forget the heritage, but to realize that the identity is a unified identity, that the Caribbean identity has a lot of races in it. And that is the best thing, I think, that the Caribbean can offer the world, that the 
presence of all these cultures in small places in which people live amicably together is a, a great example for the world, I think. Being in the margin of two cultures, it's uh, one of the principal subjects of your poetry. Is this uh, self-conscious or not? Well, I think it is a condition that is true of most of the New World. I think it is true at one point of the Americans. Even, even Protestant Americans arriving in, in New England had to do a new thing. They had to surrender their homeland and then think of America. And, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just quoting your husband, not for flattery, but to say that, you know, uh, Carlos Fuentes wrote once that if you think of the whole basin of the Caribbean, then that would touch on certain writers. And he even includes Faulkner in that basin, you know, the Mississippi, and all the way down through, down to Colombia, right around the whole rim of the basin of the Caribbean. That that's where, <clears throat> you know, the fertility of that experience happens. So that um, that is a whole condition that is part of the experience of being in what is called the new world. Well, the new world isn't really new. You know, the same people do the same mistakes and stuff like that. But I think <clears throat> the new world in terms of the vegetation, in terms of the possibility that is there in the beauty of a lot of the new world is really the sense of trying to begin again. The self-consciousness that you're talking about, I think, it's not self-conscious in the sense of feeling awkward. It is self-conscious in the sense of there's a considerable amount of searching that has to go on in terms of resolving exactly who you are and if you feel rooted in where you are. Well, I've always felt very rooted in St. Lucia, but the questions of, you know, the questions of one's own culture evolving, the errors that are missed, you know, that are repeated and stuff like that, these remain questions, you know. Is the point of contact between language and experience something you need for your poetry? Well, <clears throat> in the sense that the renewal of a language, if you're away from it, doesn't come on the level, a, a level of society that is a level of luxury. It is a level of, on a peasant, ordinary basis, or what the language at its root, what's happening at that, on that basis. And therefore, you know, if, you, if your subject is a people who are poor, considered Ill illiterate, who have come in a condition that was humiliating, you know, of that of a slave, and yet are finding themselves attached to these places, that when you, if you're away from them, you tend to forget the sound of your own language, obviously, sometimes, the vocabulary, and also the reality of hearing the language spoken, you know, in the context of where it comes from. Like last night, a play of mine was done here that I hadn't seen or heard, it, heard done in French Creole, and it was very refreshing to hear the language translated into the language that is spoken here. And that was the ambiguity, because the play is written in, in an English dialect of Creole, but it is done in a French Creole dialect. So when you hear it done in its native voice, then it's exciting to see it done that way and to hear it. And it feels more rooted. I don't, I'm not saying I prefer one to the other, but because I'm in St. Lucia and because it's French, and you hear the French patois, then it felt very, very real and at home. You make poetry with everyday, ordinary language. When, when you began writing poetry, were you much more after the classical English? And then little by little you came into the everyday, ordinary language? No, I think you had both things going on. I mean, we got, you know, the books that were there, as I said, and the kind of education I received in terms of what is called classical, whether it's Shakespearean or Elizabethan or Dickensian even, um, that was sound. And, you know, the, re the, re the real thing, I think, is for a young writer anywhere is how much he or she reads and how deeply and how much, how excitingly, you know, one reads. Well, I was always a voracious reader, and I think you cannot be a writer without being a, a very omnivorous reader, even when you're young. So that, um, and naturally, you always want to go to what is the best and what is awe-inspiring, you know? So what you read young um, is you read the great writers and you have envy of them. You want, to, par you want to, to make yourself feel as, you know, presumptuously as great as people you've read. And it's a process of apprenticeship that is very necessary for a young writer. And this apprenticeship can happen anywhere in the world. It can happen 
on a remote island with four or five books, you know. On an island, you don't need more than four books, you know. You could read really, you know, take the Bible, you take Dante, you take Shakespeare, and you take, I don't know, some trash just to keep yourself happy. <laughs> and then there you are, you can do the whole thing. And you take Ulysses by Joyce, of course. I was going to ask you about Ulysses. Oh, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. Ulysses is um, a book that will always be underestimated because it is such a tremendous uh, book that first of all, it can be seen as a massive, a massive epic poem, but the, the, the beauty of it is it's done on an ordinary basis. The, there are no heroes in it. It's done on a day-to-day -day basis, and the scale of it is very narrow. Just a guy walking around one day, you know. But it is, it is first of all, the supreme achievement of the realistic novel. It is the end of the 19th century, not the beginning of the 20th century, um, that novel. And also the language is so, well, so obviously so rich that it is like having a mine in your own territory, you know. I mean, something you can go to and extract things from. It's a very, writers go back to Ulysses to be nourished, to remember what it's like to try to write well. With your book, Homeros, you are honoring Homer and the Iliad. However, Homeros, you, you have said and denied that it's an epic book. Is, is it or not an epic poem, your poem? Well, it has been described as an epic poem mainly because I think it's big, it's long, you know. And generally, we've, the word epic has been degenerated into meaning it's very big, like, you know, an epic Hollywood movie, you know. A lot of, costs a lot of money, or so it's very big, you know. Um, I, when it came out and the reviews came out, and the category, the category that was generally given to it was that of it was an epic. I, uh, epic, if you use the word epic, I think, in a context in the Caribbean, you associate it with, you know, a hero, with battles. That's an ordinary version of it. But an epic is a thing of adventure, of travel, of search, and so on, very physical thing. And I imagine, yes, that the book does have that. I'm afraid of the description of epic because it makes me sound as if I'm competing with the Iliad or the Odyssey, you know, in which there are battles and heroes. I think it's the opposite of saying that there are battles and heroes, that that sea out there, is a battlefield for a fisherman, and that any fisherman who leaves that bay and goes out to sea alone, or with a friend, or with a companion, is undertaking a, a frightening journey, in a way. So that um, the whole sense of engagement, and in, in, in an elemental engagement of a man against nature, that kind of thing, and yes, the scope is epic, and it does have a couple of battles in it and stuff like that. It's just the idea, it's a very dangerous idea, I think, to, in a way, it's dangerous politically and it's dangerous in a literary sense to look for some big emblematic hero because that leads to another kind of aggressiveness of mentality. Uh, the epics that we have, for instance, the epic of Virgil is a, is a sort of propaganda epic, you know, of, of, of Aeneas expanding the Roman Empire or founding the Roman Empire or any of the other epics in which some emblematic hero is a conqueror and stuff like that. For us, who have been conquered, uh, to reverse it and say, well, we need a conqueror, you know, is dangerous. I don't think that is a sensibility. And in that sense, to consider, it certainly was not my intention to say, well, we need an epic, I'd better do one. I just began the book as a very simple tribute to, to the island. Um, and it grew larger and larger until it stopped, that's all, you know. Has writing ever been a struggle? For you? Um, if you mean what has my life been in terms of physical discomfort or worry, um, yeah, sure. Uh, but I mean, I think, you see, I think the thing about choosing to be a poet is that once you choose to do that, that's what you're going to do. and. Although you may go through very bad passages in terms of not having any money or, you know, your marriages have failed or something like that, I mean, that's what you do. Um, and that you have something to go to, you, it's something you wake up for, you know. So it's not really, you know, you could dramatize the struggle. You can make it a melodramatic thing, which, I, you know, I don't believe in. You've chosen to be a writer, then that's what you chose. So whatever came with that, is, that's what came with it, you know. Um, so I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't describe it as a struggle ever. It's been a joy to be a writer. And especially, I've been lucky to work in a place like this. I mean, really lucky. 
so that um, whatever else has happened around the fact, you know, the, 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 the physical stuff uh, in terms of struggle. And of course, obviously, there's been a lot of pain, and there still is sometimes a lot of things that happen that you can't control or you try to control. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that poetry or any kind of writing should be seen as a therapy or as an escape. It, you know, you don't, you don't run to it because you want to run away from the world. But still, it fortifies, you know. It, it does that on its own. It gives you strength, you know. What could it be an epic theme in contemporary life? And I think there's a... American poets, for instance, don't seem to me to take on the scale of their continent. Um, you know, America is a vast country, and the very fact of its size. There's an epic journey across America, for instance. There's certainly an epic tragedy in what happened to the American Indian, you know. Um, that's unwritten of any value, of anything. You know, most of the American writers have, instead of turning around and looking over their shoulders at what happened to the American Indian, even in Whitman, you know, um, which is a massive, tragic subject, uh, they go over to Europe and talk about how poor Europe is falling apart, you know. Um, an old subject, you know, Europe doesn't ever fall apart, and Europe is used to ruins. Europe loves ruins, you know. Whereas if, if, if the look at America were over its shoulder and the writers confronted, you know, the huge subject of the destruction, the horror of the destruction and punishment of the American Indian, that's a vast, tragic subject that has never really been well done, or ever done, I think. Is our uh, politics included in a possible epic? Oh, yeah, I mean, it depends. I think. Certain epics, you know, certainly Virgil's epic, and um, in a way, I guess you can say the Iliad, uh, and certainly the epic, um, the epic plays of Shakespeare, the historical epics, have a sort of purpose. They have a historical, patriotic purpose in a sense. And what I'm saying is that not to have that purpose and to appear powerless is good, because if you associate poetry with power, then, you know, you do a very funny thing. You make power poetic, you know, and then you ascribe the wrong duty to poetry, which is to associate it with power. And everybody knows that, you know, you can't trust politicians, you can't trust politics, you can't trust any system. Any system? None. Certainly, of course not. What are your thoughts about the end of the Cold War? The end of the Cold War has meant that any country that says it needs um, equality, social equality, can now be branded as communist. So that the third world description of what should be just a socialist endeavor, because of the fact that you know the empire, the Russian Empire has collapsed, we are supposed to accept the fact that once the Russian Empire has collapsed, then any idea of social equality automatically collapses with it. And that is terrible, because then, if somebody gets up and shouts, you know, give my people X, or what are you doing this, are you exploiting us, and so on, then the general mentality is that that is passe, that that is over, you know. And for another generation of people coming up, whose future is dominated by the opinion of political centers like Washington or Paris or wherever, then just to raise your fist and say equality means, you know, you're a communist or you're a passé communist, which is worse. Is there still possible the creation or invention of a new system? Political system? Well, I political mean, system, never no, a political, if you're talking about utopia, I think utopia is impossible, but it's the effort to establish one that is worth it, obviously. Um, you obviously want to create an equal society, and the effort to create it in whatever shape or whatever ideology that wants to do it, you know, absolutely it's necessary for it to happen, that you can do it. Systems fail, possibly, and that's where the utopian part appears to be stupid. If the state had the instinct of poetry, if the, if aesthetics could become a substitute for politics, if there was an aesthetics of politics, then questions of conscience would be automatic. 
then the possibility of the concept of a society which believes in the beauty of conduct, you know, the attempt to do it would be possible. But the democracies are hypocrites. Obviously, we know that because, you know, the statement that is there in even the Declaration of Independence is a cliché, right? We, we believe that all men are created equal. Well, why do you have to say that? If you believe it, why do you have to state it, you know? Um, and of course, that statement is made when there was slavery, you know? But, you know, as Orwell said, but some are more equal than others. Do you know what I'm saying? So conditions of political conditions of definition of what is an ideal society have to be there. Uh, and that's what I'm saying, that when the only people who are allowed to define an ideal society are people who have the money and who have the power. So that if, if I, for instance, as an insurrectionist, decided I would like to see an equal society, and somebody in Washington says, yeah, you may want an equal society, but yes, you're not ready for it yet, you know, then what happens, you know? Uh, Derek Walcott, do you consider yourself an optimist? You can't live in a climate like this without... Well, first of all, you, you, you're grateful to live in all its beauty. And if you call it optimism, well, it's not even optimism, it's reality, you know, it's real. It's not that you like it to be a nice day. You get up and it's a fantastic day. You know, you, you like the sea to be awe-inspiring, and it is, and so on. So, I don't think I'd define myself as an optimist or a pessimist. It, because of the geography, I'm neither. You know, I'm just there, you know. What about that sense of humor of yours? It comes very really... corny, very corny. Very corny. <laughs> no, very, no, very, very, very. not at all. But well, does it really come from, from the deeper stuff? Of oh, I, the, the West Indies, the great thing about the Caribbean is that it has, it doesn't take itself, it's not pompous, it's not a pompous society. I mean, I have lived in those societies in which, you know, writers are very serious people and stuff like that. Uh, or, to be, or, you, or, you know, you make jokes or you maybe laugh too much and stuff like that, you know. It's just that there's an ebullience, an exuberance, a joy, and I think it's part of the climate, I think it's part of the delight of being in, in that cli climate, so that there's a... The disposition of the Caribbean people can be separated from the geography of the Caribbean people, you know? What does love mean to you? At this moment? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> love, what do you mean, between a man and a woman, you mean? Or love in a bigger sense? Well, you can choose, it's up to you. You can choose whatever well, you want. Well, if I spoke about love you know, on television, it would sound too pompous, but I mean... I mean, if you're talking about love in, in the real sense of it, in the Dantesque sense of it, in the sense of the gospel, of loving one another, you know. See, it's possible that it is happening, right? Maybe without love, what is love? Love is a tolerance of the other person's conduct, right? An understanding of the other person's conduct. I think there's a lot of understanding in the Caribbean. I think there's an understanding of religious beliefs. I think that the fact that a Muslim believes in, you know, in Muhammad and a Hindu believes in someone else and then a Christian believes in someone else and that tomorrow morning they're not going to get up and start stabbing, start stabbing each other as they're doing all over the world or having ethnic cleansing because in the name of love, you know, um, it's, it, sounds, it sounds a little sentimental, but you see, I see it, you know, I see, at least I see a tolerance. It's possible. Well, yeah, you see it in Trinidad, you see a tolerance of the other person's religious beliefs, you know, um, a life that is not vengeful and stuff like that, you know. So you can have visible evidence of the possibility of love may sound like too strong a word to use, but certainly in terms of tolerance and understanding of what the other person's belief is, it, it happens. Before I thought you had yellow eyes, but now I see they are really green or blue eyes. They came after whom? I don't know. Genetically, I, I don't know. Mother? Uh, father? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> um, the sea, I don't know. The sea? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, unless red is from, I don't know. The sky? No, no, no. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's how they are. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Would you describe who is Derek Walcott? No, I couldn't do that. No. Um, most times, Derek Walcott is an idiot. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, no. That's no, I can't. True. I can't. Um, if you're asking me about what a public image of me may be, which is, you know, I'm very tired of seeing now, you know. Um, 
I don't know, I can't say. I think I like to think of myself as someone who has repaid uh, what he, the debt he feels to the people he comes from, mainly. That's it. That's all I want out of my life, really, basically, in terms of some estimate of who I was, in terms of my own conduct and things that I've done or whatever. I haven't done any worse or any, you know, than anyone else. You know? No different from anybody else, making the same mistakes, same kind of thing. You know? What gives you joy? Um, well, there are a lot of things that give me joy, but in terms of practical terms, I feel like last night, the theatre, you know, to feel that again, to see the actors working together and the great elation that was there, that gives me a lot of joy. To, to, it's such a struggle for actors here to establish some kind of art that is firm and respected, you know. And when it's achieved sometimes, then you, you really feel happy that it's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can go to swim. <laughs> All right. Across the bay, the ridge bristled once with a fort. Then the inner promontory itself. Its shipping was martial then. Its traffic in masts, the swift fleet of both navies. Sails soared to the bosun's piping like seven seas kettle. Squadrons would slowly surge from volcanic inlets. Its map, riddled with bays like an almond leaf, provided defense or siege, but its cannons, set in their spiked circle, could blaze like the forehead of Mars. Now French, now British yards fluttered from its morns. No sooner was one flag set than another battle unraveled its lanyards and a bugle hoisted the ire. Its lanyards and a bugle hoisted the other. Each sunset with its charred flagships, its smoldering fires, its coals, fanned by the breeze at landfall, dilated and died, every red coat an ember. <laughs>